Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are a fan of creepy or scary stories, please remember to subscribe, like, share, and comment. It really does help the channel out, and it also reminds you of every time I upload a video. With that being said, it is time to go back to ashes, for once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person the next day. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Creepy Encounters. Right after this intro and ad will play, I'll read the first story and ad will play, and after that there will be no more ads within this video. So a bit of a backstory. First, me and some friends knew this guy over the summer because one of my friends was cheating on her boyfriend with him. He knew so. There's, like, no animosity between him and us. But the guy was always a creep. For example, I have scars on my arm. Not bad at all. You have to look really close to see them. But this guy was looking close. Like, I could feel his stare burning a hole through my arm. Kinda close. He was also very touchy with my underage friends. I kind of freaked out and made sure none of my friends went around this guy. So, flash forward until now. I'm in a store. It was 6.32 p.m. and it's nighttime. I'm buying fresh scooped ice cream for me and my roommate and I'm about to walk home. Then, this guy walks in and says, Hey! With the most blank, creepy voice ever. And you knew when you saw him and looked into his eyes. There was nothing looking back. Like, I mean, nothing in his eyes. Yeah, that was this fucker. Like, I mean, mega fucking uncanny valley. So, I'm starting to ignore it. Like... What's bro gonna do? I'm in a store. So I walk out with my ice cream and take the back worker entrance because my mom works there. It was on her shift. And this guy follows me. Like, I don't know why he would. My hair was a mess and I wasn't wearing any makeup, just sweatpants and a hoodie with chocolate stains on it. So I keep walking fast and this dude is still following me. So I make it to the bend of my road. He does too. I'm halfway down and a car has to pass through, so he watches me go home from the edge of the road. Fucking creep. And my mom's response? Damn, sweetie, I'm so sorry that happened. And this dick went back to watching TV. Now, I have to walk to the bus stop, but I'm scared as hell because it's dark out. There's an abandoned house that you can get into on the way there. He could, like, hide in there, if you know what I mean. And I know this dude has a shit ton of time on his hands to do something like this. Like, I'm 16. I just want to be on time to first period. So, I didn't get detention. Finally, I told my mother about it again. Apparently, she had pulled the guy over and had a conversation with him. After that, I didn't see much of him anymore. I've traveled alone through the U.S. many times. This is giving me many opportunities to live through some absolutely bizarre situations. I've had two different encounters where I thought I was about to enter the nightmare of my life. Situation number one. I was camping near Tessacue, about an hour from Santa Fe on a weeknight. It was cold. I was supposed to leave early in the morning for Texas, and it was forecasted to snow. Being the young genius that I was, I slept in my Jeep to negate all of this. Middle of the night, an SUV quite literally skids to a stop across the gravel, into my campground. This wakes me up, and I was obviously on edge. This SUV is blasting mariachi music. Incredibly odd, but I figured these people were just drunks or they were high. The doors open and these people get out and start running through the woods, 
screaming bloody murder. I mean, these people sound like they're going to die. I am at an absolute utter loss. After maybe a minute or two, everything gets suddenly quiet, and I didn't hear them anymore. Tucked into my sleeping bag, I'm starting to absolutely shit myself. I'm sitting here, cramped up in the back of my Jeep, wishing and praying them to go away. I don't know how long it was. I dared not look at my phone. But eventually, I heard quiet voices around my Jeep. The only thing I caught was, do you think someone is in there? As you can imagine, I absolutely lost my cool. I just started screaming and crawled as fast as I could to the front seat where I turned on the lights and the key in the ignition. As I looked up, I see these people scattering away like roaches into the trees and down the mountainside. Ever since, I keep a J-frame revolver in my center console whenever I would travel. My state's permit is recognized in a lot of places, so it's a nice luxury to have. Number 2. This was in the city of Little Rock, Arkansas. I was heading to Oklahoma from the East Coast to visit family for Christmas. I was too cheap to pay for a hotel, so I got off on I-40, parked behind a hotel, and slept in my Jeep. Middle of the night, I get woken up by the sound of a small scraping noise. Confused, I open my eyes to see a figure right outside attempting to work the zipper on my soft top. Horrified, I simply sat there. It wasn't until he or she managed to stick their hand through the small opening they had created that I reached out, grabbed the nearest thing to me, which was a Coleman lantern, and smashed their hand with it. Without waiting to see the result of this, I jumped into the front seat worked the ignition, and peeled the hell out of that hotel parking a lot faster than I think I have ever left anywhere. I didn't stop for gas, red lights, breakfast, or anything. I merged straight onto I-40 and continued west for almost 30 miles. Needless to say, that was the last time I ever slept in my Jeep. This happened my junior year of high school, back when me and my friends were around 16 to 17 years of age. I'm a sophomore in college now, so almost three years ago. Some background on the story. Of course, me and my friends, I'll name them John and Lily and Luke. John was my SO at the time, and Lily and Luke were boyfriend-girlfriend also. So we were a group of two boys and two girls. We all live in Idaho and went to the same high school together. We had this grand idea of all wanting to go camping together. After a few weekends of this not working out and the weather getting colder and colder, we made mandatory plans that we would have to go camping on what could easily be the last somewhat nice weekend there was. So, after some decision making, we planned to go up a road called 8th Street that leads directly into National Forest and spend a night there. John and I had been up there a few weeks ago as an after-school adventure and found it to be a pretty cool place. We had even found a nice-looking camp spot that we had in mind. So that weekend, I believe we left Saturday afternoon. We gathered up camp supplies, took my Suburban, Luke's Jeep, my dog Bella, and headed to the base of 8th Street. This was a whole adventure in itself because what starts out as a paved road becomes four-wheel drive terrain about 20 minutes in, which is always fun. Picking our way over rocks and large trenches caused by rain, the surrounding wilderness changes drastically too. In about a 45-minute time span, you move from the middle of downtown to the middle of the foothills, sage, brush, and grass, to a large pine forest. Idaho is like this. It's very easy to escape the city. 
Just drive an hour in any direction away from the city and you were basically in the middle of nowhere. We had planned to leave earlier in the day, but since we were unorganized, never on time kids, we left a lot later than expected. Meaning we got up to the top of 8th as it was breaking dusk. I'll explain what the location looks like a bit here. Basically, going up 8th means exactly that. Up. To the top of one of the mountains that looks over the entire city. We made our way onto what is a dirt road that travels along a pretty wide ridge of a mountain and went to the spot John and I had found earlier. To our dismay, we could see cars and a fire there. Someone had taken our spot. So we continued down the road, further than John and I explored the last time we were up here, hoping to find another spot. We were getting a little down because the road seemed to be winding down the other side of the ridge into the forest. We wanted to be on top of the ridge to see the city. Finally, we found a spot. It was perfect. We parked our cars, started a fire, popped open some beers, the whole shebang. The spot needs to be described a bit for the story. So picture a tiny hill with the top half shaved off to make a flat area. But the side where the road leads to, the top of the mountain, is a bit taller, almost like half crater. This hill was on top of the mountain ridge, and the main road we had been following winded around the base of the hill and continued along. It's obvious the place had been used as a camping site many times before. Old fire, glass, shotgun shells, etc. Other side note. When you are driving up to the top part of the hill, it is very steep, and you can't see the flat area until after your car comes over the edge of the crater-like hill. Even when you drive the main road around the base of the hill, you can't really see where people are camping. So basically, after you slowly creep up the hill and are brave enough to continue over the edge, that makes you pretty convinced that you could be driving off the side of a cliff. Your car rolls over the edge and you see the flat part of the hill. But the sight is not bad after that. Look towards the city and you could see it down the mountain. Look the other way and you could see a big valley of trees and more mountains. So about an hour in, Lily and Luke decide to take a walk and follow the main road some more. I don't know why. To me, this was a crazy idea. John and I were way too scared of the dark to do this. But they, being their natural freak selves, walked off down the road. John and I chilled by the fire with the dog for a bit. But slowly, without Luke and Lily, we both got a little spooked. A few times we decided that we should head down the road and follow our friends. We tried this a few times, but would get spooked and race back up the road, up to our little hill, into the site. Once we gave up with that idea, we climbed to the top of my Suburban with a blanket. I guess being up there felt safer, so the boogeymen couldn't get to us. Or at least we could see them approaching if they tried. We started to notice that they had been gone a long time, and that the fire was running out of wood. We wanted to wait for them to get wood with, but it seemed they were not coming back anytime soon, so we decided to work on gathering wood by ourselves. Of course, being idiot kids didn't bring an axe. What we did bring was a hatchet, a Rambo knife, and a machete. Odd, I know, but having these things is kind of normal in Idaho. So we gathered those up for chopping wood and for protection, bundled up a bit, and started to head over to the base of a big pine tree. It was then we could hear an engine from somewhere deep in the valley. We could also see headlights way down below. It was quiet, so it was pretty easy to hear. I guess the road that we took is the same road they were on, just much further down. Curious. 
We watched as they winded up and up, then eventually came into view as they drove under our little hill. Not super odd, although it was pretty late, but whatever. They passed below the hill and we expected to see them continue along the road, but as they rounded our hill, their brake lights turned on. They turned sharply and began to make their way up our hill on the steep side of the road. Okay, um, odd. I guess this is okay because they couldn't really see us driving along the road. They will drive up and over the little ridge, see us camping, then drive off knowing they drove right into somebody's campsite on accident. The truck, a giant white brand new looking ram, rolls over the ridge and its headlights flood the entire campsite like deer in headlights. We stare. To our surprise, they move forward a little bit more, so they are pretty solidly over the ridge. Then they park and the engine dies and the headlights finally turn off. We are just standing there staring at this odd truck that pulled into our campsite. The fire is positioned between us and the car and they are about 15 feet from the fire and us, about the same distance on the other side of the fire. We must look insane. We have jackets with hoods on, holding a collection of weapons, staring dumbfounded at this truck. I'm telling you, if I had pulled into that campsite and saw us, I would have floored it the fuck out of there. Meanwhile, my dog Bella, a black and white Springer Spaniel, is going batshit crazy with the new intruders, running around the front of the truck, barking and growling, and just all out losing it. A person hops out of the driver's seat. A man and a lady hops out of the passenger side a few seconds later. They completely ignore my dog. I mean, she's not huge, only like 45 pounds, but still. I would have at least been weary of a dog acting like that. Without saying a word, they just walk up to our fire and stand there. We haven't moved. The man says hi at this point. He seems very friendly, talking to us like a good old friend, and goes on about how he used to love camping in this exact spot as a kid. Talks about a tree that grew nearby that he remembers being itty bitty and he asks how we are doing, etc., etc. Small talk. We are weirded out, so our answers are kind of short. We are still trying to figure out what in the hell was going on and who this man was. I noticed he was very clean cut, thin, and wearing nice shoes, jeans, and a North Face jacket. He didn't look like he had been camping, I was focused on the man, so I couldn't really describe his wife. If she was even his wife, that is. She didn't say a word, just sat there. I don't even remember him introducing himself, but a few things he did say stood out. At one point, he brings up that he saw two kids down the road a bit and asks us if we knew them. We say yes, that they are our friends and they were on a walk. Meanwhile, I'm looking at his truck, expecting to see one of our friend's lifeless hand hanging out of the bed or something. And at another point, I had answered his question about how we were doing by saying we were a little spooked, to which he responds to me with, I have a gun that you could shoot, if that would make you feel better. I tell him, uh, no thanks. I didn't really want a gun out anyway. Plus, who goes shooting at night? He asks if we have any guns. I tell him no. Right after I say this, I am kicking myself for not saying yes. So now we are standing here, talking to this random guy by our fire, which is currently dying, mind you. His overly nice demeanor is creeping me out. So I kind of say to them that we need to get wood, and the man then offers us flashlights that he has in his truck. I tell him we are good, we had headlamps, and we wandered down the hill over to the tree. 
We are scouting around looking for wood, and I am telling John how absolutely weird this is. John doesn't usually camp, so for all he knows, this is perfectly normal behavior. Although, he agrees that the men kind of scared him. I explain that people never, and I do mean never, come up to someone's camp like this. A. It's the middle of the night. B. We are in the middle of the woods, not like a campground. C. It's just plain rude to go to someone's campsite. A lot of the times people go camping, it's to find peace and quiet. D. This is Idaho. Who in their right mind goes up to some random campsite? Only someone who has a death wish and is willing to risk getting shot by some crazy drunk redneck with a shotgun. He didn't know what we would stumble upon. And finally, E. He came walking up all willy-nilly to two people with knives and a dog, not asking permission or anything. It was just fucking weird. I keep telling John over and over, it's just not normal. We finally came back up with a few branches and random sticks and tossed a few into the fire. I don't really remember if they said anything else, nothing of importance, because I failed to remember something specific, other than he wished us good night, got into their truck, reversed down the hill, and continued on their way. Finally, Lily and Luke wander back, and we frantically tell them what happened. Kind of laughed about it because we were still alive, but we kept saying how weird it was. We asked them if they saw the truck, and they said yes, that he had stopped to ask if they were okay. They said yes, that they were, just on a walk, and the truck left. We go back to sitting by the fire and go back to enjoying the night. When I hear that damn truck again, coming back down the road the opposite direction, I wander to the edge of the hill to watch, and he drives past the road to our campsite. I am kind of relieved, but no, brake lights, again, he stops. This time he reverses it up our little hill. Great, I was thinking. Now it's easier for him to throw us in his bed after he kills us. Again, the back of the truck rolls over the edge, down the ledge, and kind of evens out. The truck parks, turns off, and out pops the man. I now notice he has a bunch of branches in the back of his truck. He excitedly announces he bought us some firewood. Um, thanks? He proceeds to drag... I kid you not, an entire fucking tree out of the bed of his truck. With us kind of trying to help, we drag this huge thing next to the fire. We thank him in a not sure kind of way. He again says goodnight, smiles, hops back in his truck, and heads down the road he originally came up. We could hear and see his truck move back down the valley until he was gone. We didn't hear or see from him again. We were car camping, and I made sure to lock all the doors. I didn't sleep that night, half expecting to hear the engine of that truck at any moment throughout the night. It was morning. We spent the day wandering, hiking around up there, then headed down late afternoon with no sign of the truck. I didn't tell my mom. She was kind of freaked out. And now she doesn't let me go camping without our pistol. We had some ideas. Maybe he was a forest stranger, or maybe someone looking for potential poachers. Maybe an overly friendly good citizen. Who knows? But like I said, he and the whole situation made me feel quite strange. And that isn't how you act when you're out in the woods. But he never did pull anything. Which is what matters the most. So, odd man in the white truck, whoever you are, please don't come to my campsite ever again. This is going to be a long camping story told to you 
by someone who doesn't speak English as their native tongue. So please be patient and understanding. Romania is a country where people might get kidnapped, murdered, disappear, and such. So yeah. My parents were legitimately afraid for me and were against the idea. I had to lie to them that we would stay in a hotel near the Cozia National Park so they would get off my back. Obviously, that's not what we did. Okay, so long story short, we had to like travel from Bucharest to this park, which is around 200 kilometers and two hours by train. We got our immense backpacks, everything we needed, and went on our way. Nothing specifically happened in the train except for the fact that the train was overly crowded, with the exception of our train compartment being completely empty. This is extremely rare for Romanian trains. I get excited thinking that we have that whole compartment to ourselves. As I said, it is a very rare thing to happen. And, of course, after 10 to 20 minutes, it got occupied by a man entering our compartment, accompanied by a beautiful German Shepherd. I love all kinds of animals, cats and dogs in particular. I usually find my way around all animals, even those that don't like people. Not this dog, nope. This dog was otherworldly. He was so fluffy, he reminded me of a stuffed animal. He would listen to his owner's every single command. I was impressed by it, so obviously I started asking the man about this dog, since it would be a long and awkward trip, and so we wouldn't have to sit in complete silence. The man was exactly like his dog, except the commands he would give to his dog, no other contribution to the conversation. He told me the dog's name is Uchigashul, which is Romanian. It means the killer. It's a very weird name to give a dog because, for this particular example, we would use the English word as it is, not translate to the word Romanian and name the dog like that. But I thought to each their own. I asked him, why such a scary name? And he bluntly replied, this dog is trained to kill. It's the only thing he likes and is good at. Now, I personally consider that the dog will grow up to have similar personality to his owner. And most of the times, I would judge people with dogs on how that animal reacts to the world and to his owner. And let me tell you guys, these two did not give a good vibe in return. I brushed everything over, thinking to myself that maybe this guy is training his dog to hunt in the woods. Then I started thinking which woods are legal to hunt in our country. While I was thinking of that, the guy, out of nowhere, asks us if we were traveling to the Cozia National Park. That was surprisingly accurate, considering that the only time we mentioned the place was in the train station, long before we found our seats, and way longer before we even met this guy. Again, I thought it was nothing because, in my country, people who happen to go in the same direction will try to make small talk and guess where you are heading. Of course, you can just lie to keep safe of your destination, or, to be honest, I took the honesty route, and I am judging myself for that. Never to be honest with strangers, or honest at all, after you read this story. We confirmed that we were going to that place, and asked what else is there to see around, since he started talking about the area, and well, considering we knew nothing about the place, we took it all in. He told us about the woods, the vegetation, the animals we would encounter, told us about a beautiful monastery right at the bottom of the mountain that we need to climb, advised us to visit the Lortishore waterfall and explore the caves behind it and to try out the local restaurant. 
When this guy started talking about the wilderness and nature, his eyes glowed as if he was experiencing a pleasant memory. But he also grabbed his dog's collar from the neck, squeezing it tight. The collar made a loud click sound. What surprised me was that the dog made no move, no whimper, no twitch, nothing. Just like a stuffed animal. Anyway, we reached our destination, said our goodbyes, and the man waves at us, and we faced against him to go on our way. I turned around back right away because I wanted to ask where exactly the restaurant was, and the man and dog were no longer there. Not just that, but also his luggage was gone. That creeped me out a bit, but who cares? We were too thrilled for our first camping experience. We start walking with our backpacks on us, 10 kilograms each, and reach a tunnel digging into the mountain. It looked amazing. Exactly like those horror movie tunnels which, if traveled during night, would make your hair stand up straight. Lucky for me, we traveled during the daytime. It wasn't a long tunnel. We could see the end. But by the time we got to the middle of it, we hear a whimper in the distance. It sounded like a dog crying in desperation for its life. We stop. My boyfriend looks at me with this, oh no, you're not going to take that dog with us type of face and tries to convince me to take a different route. We don't. I hear the dog. I go right towards the sound. And in the middle of the road, I see a chubby puppy with lots of white and brown circles on his butt, crying so hard and laying on the cement looking really hurt, as if he was hit by a car. I freeze and think to myself that our trip is over. I must save this dog. We call for him. He looks at us. Pointy ears go straight up, gets up, and like a doofus, starts running desperately to us. He was alone and afraid. We called him Rudolph, and now he was our camping buddy. Like one kilometer further, we find another puppy, probably his sister, which we dragged from the nearby river. Someone threw her in the river to kill her, we were thinking. All wet, cold, and hungry, of course we take her too. So, here we are, 10 kilogram backpacks each, two puppies at my chest, boyfriend with a map, trying to find a spot to camp the first night. We passed by the monastery, the man in the train mentioned, but because we had these puppies, we couldn't enter inside the building. The priests wouldn't allow it. So we just walked around the property, through the gardens, until we reached the base of the mountain we had to climb. I'd like to mention that these puppies were two tiny little brats because the second you put them down and forced them to walk on their own, they would slam their butts to the ground and cry, oh my God, so much drama. <laughs> I love that part about puppies. I really do and I miss it. <laughs> anyway, let's get back to our story. We walk and walk and walk until we decide to stop because it was getting late and I was beginning to get cold. I found a spot next to a small landmark type of cottage right in the middle of the woods. We call it Troyunita. It's like a scouting post, but for the church, where they place religious icons or a Bible, stuff like that, inside to bring good energy to the area. It belongs to the church. It wasn't like a house. It was basically a roof with four small walls and an opening, not a door. You could go into it, like hide from the rain. There was an icon inside and a Bible with pages ripped from it. Curious as I am, I opened the Bible, annoyed to see that people would write down their names in it, like couples do on the trees. But... On one particular page, the words, I will find you, stuck out. It was written in red ink. Again, I thought to myself that this was probably someone who wanted to scare travelers with silly messages. I put the book back and gave it no second thought. 
We put up the tent, make the fire, unpack, make food and eat. We feed the puppies, which now are cuddled up in our tent. And finally, darkness starts to rise all around us. My boyfriend always kept the fire up every hour because when it died down, it felt as if all the sounds in the woods were louder and closer to us than in reality. Now, it's around 12 a.m. We are all in the tent, cuddling to keep warm. The puppies wake up and start crying. I get up and unzip the tent and put them out to pee. They do, and I get them back in. They cry some more, and the smallest one starts shivering. At the same time, I hear grunting from behind our tent. My boyfriend is up too. He hears it as well. The fire is fading. The moment he unzips the tent and steps out, the sound disappears into the woods. It sounded like a snake slithering through the fallen leaves on the ground, but with unimaginable speed. I ask him, was that a snake? He says, up to this day, that he cannot explain what he saw. He said it was a slithery figure with feet that made a snort-like sound when the light hit it. The puppies calm back down after this creature runs into the woods. We try to go back to sleep after we reignite the fire. It's 3 a.m. this time when we wake up, with the puppies being fussy again. The fire is nearly dead. We clearly have no idea how to put up a sustaining fire, we think to ourselves. My boyfriend gets up to search for firewood, and I get out as well. I stare into the darkness, and I swear to God, I hear whispers coming from between the trees. I look up at the sky, consider it 3 a.m., and hear birds being very loud and fluttering their wings. Now, I'm no expert in birds, but don't they usually sleep around this time? Well, these weren't. They were very active, very vocal, and very frustrated. I looked at the fire and followed the red sparks popping out of it into the sky and became fascinated with something. The spark doesn't seem to die. It goes on and on, changing color from hellish red to green. This was very out of the ordinary for me because it created an illusion hard to explain. It looked as if the fire sparks were going into the woods, creating a track for me, probably to follow. I kept looking after each spark to see when it burns out. None of them did. They would levitate, turn green, and flow into the woods. At this moment, I began to get goosebumps on my skin, the birds being agitated, the mysterious light pointing us to go deeper into the woods, and all the trees around us had eyes on them. Like the trunks had a distinguished shape that looked exactly like eyes. I know this is nothing paranormal since someone explained that those shapes form when a branch is ripped from the root and that's the shape that is left afterwards. But there was so many, like a hundred eyes, all looking at the same spot where we were camping, having only that religious tiny landmark to mentally protect us. And as I inspect my surroundings, I hear movement in one of the bushes in front of our tent, like 10 meters away from us, Obviously, I stand my ground, but don't go near it. Suddenly, a dark, bent-over silhouette comes out of it, and half inside the brush and half outside. It stares at us. I call my boyfriend, and we're both like, what the fuck is that? Is it a bear cub? A wolf? A pig? The creature shakes its head the way a dog does after a bath and I hear a distinguished clink, like a dog collar. At this time, my boyfriend manages to light up the fire really large, which scares this animal to run back into the woods, though the bush from where it initially came out of. That calms us down, but not enough to ever close our eyes again during that night. Going back into the tent, my boyfriend falls asleep, 
The puppies are sound asleep, but not me. I keep the zipper on the tent open a little, just enough to have my eye peek through it, right at the early mentioned bush. I think I spent a solid hour staring and falling asleep to that bush. All of a sudden, I hear a noise coming from that direction, and I immediately wake my boyfriend up, who is now peeking through the hole in complete darkness with me. What we see next still haunts our dreams. From the exact same bush, we see a human head popping out and looking towards our tent. Note that our peeping hole was small enough to not make it look like you were actually watching someone from inside the tent. This head is slowly coming out of the bush, skin so white we thought it was a ghost. After that, a shoulder, another shoulder, a full torso, a leg. Bit by bit, an entire man emerges from the bush, completely naked, lighted by both the moon and our fire. What he did next was excruciatingly scary for me. He comes so close to our tent and begins to remove branches, rocks, etc. from our fire, basically extinguishing our fire by dismantling it. This all happening like two to three meters from our tent. I look at the man with horror because I recognized him. And now, the clink I heard earlier from that animal is explained. It is the same man from the train, with his dog too. I don't know if he followed us. I don't know if he just went the same route as us and found us and decided to stalk us. But this guy was there at 12 a.m. at least because our fire would be dead every two to three hours and we would wake up by the sound of branches being cracked, rocks being moved, which we internally explained as animals crossing the land. After he successfully managed to put out our fire, he slowly crept back into the same bush, submerging into it bit by bit until only his head would be out, with a disfigured-looking mouth, looking like a moaning ghost. You try going back to sleep after that. We didn't know what to do, so we just got back out, reignited the fire, light ourselves some torches, and stayed near the campfire until the first rays of sunshine came out. I admitted I did fall asleep while sitting down next to the fire, and so did my boyfriend, but any sound would wake us up. I was too afraid to go near that distance bush. I did not need any answers or any explanations. I just wanted daylight to get the fuck out of there, and we did. We packed our stuff, and we got the hell out of there. We planned a four-day camping trip, and this experience made us give up after the first night. It was a risk we did not intend to take. If that guy followed us, or it was just a coincidence, it was enough to ruin it all. As a conclusion to my story and any advice to first-time campers out there, never tell your location or even areas remotely close to your destination to strangers. You don't know where their minds take them and what they end up to do. Anyways, stay safe. Always be aware of your surroundings and any changes that come to you under the form of sounds, movement, changes of temperature, and so on. Always protect yourself. This happened about three years ago, but I still talk about it from time to time, and it still creeps me out. I was 21 at the time. I just moved into a new apartment on the first floor of a building. It was late one night, and my roommate was out when I heard somebody knock on the door. This was uncommon as we were in college and my roommate had friends that would come by to hang out at all hours of the day. I just figured it was one of his friends, so I get up and check the peephole. Staring right back at me through the peephole is an eyeball pressed against it. Again, 
This is also something that one of our friends might do just to be funny. I chuckled and opened the door, surprised to see a guy in his mid-twenties that I did not recognize. He was strange, to say the least. He was very hyper and immediately launched into a door-to-door -door salesman type pitch. I can't remember exactly what he even was selling, but it was something along the lines of a local university, which I was already attending at the time. The whole time he was talking, he kept looking past me into the apartment. He was fidgeting and even standing on his tiptoes to see inside. Still, I just thought the guy was weird and nervous and might not have been all there upstairs, if you know what I mean. I politely declined to buy anything from him, but he wouldn't take no for an answer. I finally had to pretty sternly tell him that I was not interested. He finally accepted defeat, and as I was closing the door, he put his hand out and stopped the door from closing. Before I can be like, what the fuck, dude? He smiles at me and says, I like Mario Kart on the Nintendo 64 too. Now me and my roommate had been staying up late into the night, playing Mario Kart 64 in my bedroom for the past several days before that. But there was nothing that he could see from the apartment entrance that had anything to do with Mario Kart. I was taken aback and trying to add things up in my head and confusingly asked, how do you know I play Mario Kart? He then got super nervous and said, oh, oh, I just thought that anyone with a couch like that would be into Mario Kart on the Nintendo 64 because, you know, it, uh, it's, it, it's, uh, it's like a retro game and that's a retro couch. What? the hell is that explanation? Then he was all like, um, okay, bye, and literally scurried away. I shut the door, locked it. I start trying to put the pieces together on how he could have known that because obviously it wasn't because of my grandma's old couch. Remember, it's a first floor apartment that backed up to woods. My roommate got home shortly after, and I immediately tell him about the encounter. He was freaked out too, so we start investigating. At first, it seemed as if there was no way to even see inside my bedroom. My blinds were always down. We went outside and tested it and found that the only way to see inside would have been if you had your face right up against the window. And even then, you kind of had to crouch and close one eye just to get a glimpse of the inside. A couple more creepy details. My window was over a balcony and the Nintendo 64 console itself was stored inside of a TV stand and was not visible. You'd only be able to see it while we were actively playing, which we never did until we were a little stoned and it was 2 a.m. So basically, this fucking creep had been jumping the railing to our balcony, pressing his face against my window and watching us play Mario Kart in the middle of the night. Never saw the guy again, but needless to say, I was pretty paranoid for a while after that. I constantly checked my windows and woke up in the middle of the night paranoid that he was standing just a couple feet away watching me sleep just a very unsettling encounter. I'm glad that nothing more came out of it and that I never saw him again, but I have always wondered what his motives truly were. As I was walking home from work last night, about halfway to my house, a disheveled man who looked to be either homeless or extremely down on his luck, crossed paths with me from the other side of the sidewalk. He had initially been walking in the opposite direction, but as soon as he saw me, he immediately turned around and started following me. He began rambling incoherently and aggressively, and his words were so slurred that I hardly understood a thing he said. 
All I could make out was something about a care package and look at you. It was obvious this man was under the influence of multiple substances. I quickened my pace and tried to avoid any eye contact with the man. And he was getting agitated that I wasn't paying attention to him. When my walking speed got too quick for his inebriated stumbling to keep up with, he stopped talking and instead began just trying to follow me. I kept looking over my shoulder at him, and every time I saw him, he would either stop or try to duck behind a bush. Finally, I started outright sprinting and looking for a spot that I could hide in myself. I came up to my local mosque and tried to sneak around the corner into the parking lot of it, where there was a tree that I hid behind. While hiding there, I frantically dialed 911. I told them that a strange man displaying unstable behavior was trying to follow me and describe my location, myself, and the man to them. The dispatcher assured me that officers were on their way to where I was, but while waiting for them, I saw a figure heading up the sidewalk in front of the parking lot I was hiding in. Panic immediately filled me until the passerby was close enough to where I could see that it was not the same man who had just bothered me, and they turned out to be harmless. Mere moments after this, the cops arrived to where I was, pulled up next to the tree, and motioned for me to come out and talk to them. The officer driving the vehicle asked me the standard questions, a description of the incident, where I was when it happened, etc., while we were talking, he spotted a man in another parking lot down the street, not far from where I had first encountered the creep. He asked me if that was the man I had encountered, and it was hard to tell between the darkness and the distance, but I was pretty sure it was. Another police vehicle had pulled into that same parking lot, and it appeared that an officer got out to talk to the man. The officer... I had been talking to asked me how far I was from my house, and I told him that I was pretty close to my street at this point. He assured me that I should be safe to walk the rest of the way home, and that they had other cop cars patrolling the area. I thanked him and finished walking home without further incident, thank God. Shortly after I got home, I saw that I had a text from my boyfriend that read, are you okay? The text had been sent at around the time the incident was occurring, as if he could sense I was in a fearful situation. I replied back telling him what had happened. He told me that he had gotten yelled at by a homeless man earlier. I described the creek I encountered to him and asked him if he thought it was the same guy. He said he didn't think so. We also had a brief phone call to make sure each other was okay. I let him know that I was home safe, and he told me he was in a vehicle with a group, so he was safe too. I don't know what the cops ended up doing about that man, but I hope he stays as far away from me as possible. And that, dear listeners, brings it close to these true creepy encounters. I'd like to take a moment and give a very special shout out to the reform members of Back to Ashes. Tammy Slayton, Mrs. Innerscare, Tina Mee, Colt Stone Wolf, Luz Crispin, C.A.G., Denise Seth, Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Norma D.W., Christy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's niece. Thank you all from the bottom of my heart for continuing supporting Back to Ashes. It really, really, really makes my soul smile. I appreciate you. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Peace, love, and light to you all.